Good evening. I'd like to call to order the City Council meeting for the City of Wheat Ridge, Colorado for March 25th, 2024. If you would please stand as you were able and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Would the clerk please call the roll of the members? Jenny Snell. Scott Ohm. Here. Rachel Holtein. Present. Janice Hoppy. Present. Amanda Weaver. Here. Corey Stites. Here. Dan Larson. Present. Leah Dozman. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, and thank you all. We have everybody here tonight, so good to see everyone. Uh, counselors, in your package you have uh, the following minutes or notes you have city council meeting minutes for february 12 2024 uh, city council meeting minutes for february 25 2024 and study session notes for march 4th 2024 are there any uh, changes or amendments to be noted in the notes uh, councillor weaver i just have a question of procedure i was not here at the march 4th meeting so should i abstain from the entire vote or we're i guess we're not voting on this we're uh, not going to vote on these, only okay. if there's an objection to them. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no uh, corrections noted, we uh, will let these stand with our thanks to the clerk. Uh, are there any changes to be noted in the agenda? Seeing none, we'll present as presented. Let's see, we have a couple of proclamations. Uh, you would join me. Yes, and I would like to invite uh, Candace Coolidge to join us at the podium. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you again. Great to see you. Good, and I've invited uh, Councillor Hoppy to join us today. She's on the uh, board for the uh, family, uh, uh, the, the Porch Light, a family justice center. And our first proclamation tonight is um, concerning Sexual Assault Awareness Month, April 2024, and Colorado Denim Day, April 24, 2024. Whereas every day, women, men, and children across Colorado suffer the pain and trauma of sexual assault. And whereas sexual violence affects individuals of all ages, backgrounds, and circumstances, and whereas this crime occurs far too frequently, goes unreported far too often, and leaves long-lasting physical and emotional scars. And whereas during National Sexual Assault Awareness Month, we recommit ourselves not only to lifting the veil of secrecy and shame surrounding sexual violence, but also to raise awareness and expanding support for victims. And whereas at the state level, we must work to promote necessary resources to victims of every circumstance, including medical and mental health services, relocation and housing assistance, and advocacy during criminal justice processes. And whereas, Porchlight Family Justice Center provides comprehensive legal, emotional, and critical supportive services for survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, abuse of at-risk individuals, elder abuse, and human trafficking. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Bud Starker, Mayor of the City of Wheat Ridge and the Wheat Ridge City Council, do hereby declare the month of April 2024 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month and further recognize April 24, 2024 as Colorado Denim Day, encouraging, encouraging Wheat Ridge residents to wear denim to show their support for the victims of sexual assault and highlight this issue in our community. Dated this 25th day of March, 2024. This is for you, and would you like to say a few words? Thank you. Thank you very much. Similar to domestic violence, 
Sexual violence at its core revolves around power and control. One effective tool we have in our community to support survivors of sexual assault is to provide them with options and resources to empower them to move forward and take control in the way that is right for them. Porchlight strives to improve the experience of those who have experienced trauma and abuse in our community by bringing together community partners to one location where survivors can walk in without an appointment for free and receive services. Services like the Blue Bench providing comprehensive metro-wide support through their hotline and advocates that are on site at Porchlight Family Justice Center. Services like the sexual assault nurse examiners who um, are also available at Porchlight. They are forensic nurse examiners through our partner. What was St. Anthony is uh, currently Common Spirit Health. Prior to our center, survivors had to go to the emergency room, not a specialized place for sexual assault examinations, but to the ER where they'd be worried about being charged, long wait times, dealing with the chaos of the emergency room. Now they come to Porchlight. In our community, we are so fortunate to have had the support of municipalities like Wheat Ridge that have recognized there's a better way to support victims in our community. Thank you for your support and recognition of survivors in Wheat Ridge and for the advocates that work tirelessly every day to ensure that we do better. Thank you. Thank you. This is yours. We're gonna have a little photo op right here right now. Thank you. Thank you for the great work that you do. Thank you so much. And I would like to invite Jennifer Kemps, the development officer for Ralston House, to join me. Jennifer, how are you tonight? Good. Thank you for being here. This is a proclamation about Child Abuse Prevention Month, April 2024. Whereas every child deserves to grow up in a safe, nurturing environment, free from harm and fear, every responsible person will agree that one abused child is one too many. And whereas the month of April has been designated nationally as Child Abuse Prevention Month, we encourage all community members to join in renewing our commitment to learning what we can do to promote the safety and well-being of children. And whereas, Wheat Ridge has dedicated individuals and organizations who work daily to counter the problem of child abuse and to help parents obtain assistance as they need. And whereas, our community is stronger when all community members become aware of child abuse prevention and become involved in supporting parents to raise their children in a safe and nurturing environment. And whereas, effective child abuse prevention programs succeed because of partnerships among families, social service agencies, schools, religious and civic organizations, law enforcement agencies, and the business community. And whereas, Ralston House Child Advocacy Center works with law enforcement Child Protective Services, District Attorney's, Attorney's Offices in the 1st and 17th Judicial Districts, and the community to provide a safe place to investigate child abuse and provide victim services for children who have been physically or sexually abused or witnessed violence. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Bud Starker, Mayor of the City of Wheat Ridge and the Wheat Ridge City Council, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2024 to be Child Abuse Prevention Month, dated this 25th of day, May 2024. This is for you. Would you like to say a few words? So thank you so much. Part of this campaign that we're going to do for April is you'll see our blue pinwheels, hopefully all around Jefferson County. I've partnered with a um, Boy Scout who, for his Eagle Project, has chosen to work with Ralston House. So our goal is to put 50 uh, pinwheels throughout the community in Jefferson County. We're partnering with libraries, rec centers. So if you know of any location here in Wheat Ridge that might be a great place to display a pinwheel garden, please let me know. We are putting one here at City Hall as part of the police department, and the detectives there have partnered with us to make that program well known. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the work.
Okay, we will now go to our public's right to speak. Members of the public may come and speak to the council for a maximum of three minutes under our public's right to speak. Um, I have uh, two uh, individuals signed up here in the council to speak tonight. Um, when I uh, call your name, if you would please come to the podium and, and uh, give us your first name and your last name, and then you'll have uh, three minutes to, to address the council. And our first speaker is Mr. Scott Peak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. My name is Scott Peak, and I am here this evening on behalf of Intermountain Health and Lutheran Medical Center to share some updates on our Lutheran Legacy campus redevelopment, which is an important and exciting opportunity for our city, and I thank you for your time and attention. As you may know, Intermountain Health's Lutheran Medical Center will stop its acute care hospital operations at its current site the same day we move to a replacement facility. That big day is August 3rd. 2024 if you want to mark your calendars. The new hospital will be at Clear Creek Crossing development and will offer state-of-the-art health care for our community. The current property on 38 spans approximately 100 acres and will be redeveloped guided by the City of Wheat Ridge Master Plan which we helped co-create and that was adopted by the City Council in 2021. The document reflects the community's vision and outlines a framework for future development it communicates the community's expectations to prospective development partners. We want to ensure that the redevelopment of our legacy campus improves the quality of life in our city by providing new opportunities which are guided by the input of many stakeholders, including the city and the Wheat Ridge community. A request for proposal or RFP is expected to be released within the next few weeks to gauge interest from the developer community. There are a few essential aspects of the RFP that I want to highlight. First, a dedicated selection committee comprised of representatives from Intermountain Health will evaluate the submitted proposals. We are committed to maintaining the safety and appearance of our old hospital site and campus during and after decommissioning. The community's input and concerns are deeply valued and will be considered throughout our transition. Intermountain Health is aware of the chapel and farmhouse on the legacy campus and we respect and value the city's resolution to recognize the structures as important to the community and we will stress those desires to potential developers. Finally, we will continue to comply with all applicable processes and work closely with the city of Wheat Ridge during this decommissioning process. In conclusion, we thank you for your support and wonderful collaboration. You've been great partners on this project. Uh, we believe uh, not only are we excited about our new hospital, but this legacy campus redevelopment will be a positive and transformative change for our city, and we look forward to continuing to work with you towards that end. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peake, and we look forward to um, a great new project and process, so thank you. Our next speaker is um, Lynn or Lon Browning. Hi, my name is Lynn Browning. Sorry, I scribbled that a bit. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking, but Council Member Holton encouraged me to at the door as we've just met. Um, I am a new resident here, just moved in at the end of January, and I've always been involved in community development and local uh, government. And so I wanted to come and see how things are going on here in Wheat Ridge. So that's really just it. I'm here to learn and observe. I do want to say thank you for your proclamations tonight. As a survivor of childhood sexual abuse personally, your actions demonstrate compassion and concern. I look forward to getting to know you all more. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining us tonight. That's all the speakers I have signed up to speak, so we will close our public's right to speak and move to agenda item number one. This is our consent agenda. Uh, uh, Councillor Snell, would you please introduce this item? 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would be happy to. This is um, item number 1A, resolution number 12-2024, a resolution amending the fiscal year 2024 budget to reflect the approval of a supplemental budget appropriation in the amount of $75,000 for improvements to council chambers. Would you like me to read the issue? If you would read the issue statement. Sorry about that. The city receives approximately $27,000 per year from the public educational and governmental access channel fee assessed by the local cable franchising authority, Comcast, for costs associated with the channel. Staff recommends some improvements and upgrades to equipment in council chambers so that public meetings can be more effectively managed, presented, and televised. This request appropriates funds restricted for those purposes to make the improvements. Should I carry on 1B? 1B. Thank you. This is item number 1B, motion to approve the contract with Govos for the tax and licensing revenue system in the amount of $95,626. In 2021, City Council determined a priority of the city must be to streamline permitting and licensing to assist the business community in working with Wheat Ridge and provide greater customer service. Following a two-year evaluation period of systems and existing business processes, the city has selected five systems to drive efficiency and modernize business practices. The first system to be purchased and implemented is Govos, Govos. I'm sure I'll get that right later, which will facilitate tax and business licensing, filling, and collection. And we also have item 1C. This is resolution number 13-2024, a resolution amending the fiscal year 2024 budget to reflect the approval of a supplemental budget appropriation in the amount of $233,025 for the purposes of accepting an urban forestry grant and authorizing the mayor to execute an agreement with the Urban Sustainability Directors Network in the amount of $669,073 for expanding the urban tree canopy in Wheat Ridge. The city of Wheat Ridge was awarded $669,073 in funding from the USDA Urban and Community Forestry Grant Program to plant approximately 1,180 trees in Wheat Ridge parks, open spaces, and rights of way, and as part of several capital improvement projects across the city. To receive and appropriate the funding, the city must accept the grant award by directing the mayor to sign the attached grant agreement and approve a supplemental budget appropriation. Thank you. This is our consent agenda. May I have a motion to approve uh, consent agenda items number 1A, 1B, and 1C? Uh, apologies, sorry. Councillor Snell, you can just simply say, I so move. Uh, I so move. Second. Apologies. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Would the clerk please poll the council? All ayes, no nays. The motion carries. Thank you. We will go to agenda item number two. Councillor Hoppy, would you please introduce this item? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce this item. It's a motion to approve a contract to buy and sell real estate from Jefferson County School for District for the Green at 38th. We're probably going to have a presentation. So uh, this is going to be a resolution to the council. Wants me to read that. At oh. uh, issue, okay. staff received direction from City Council in 2018 to engage a designer to develop conceptual designs for a community gathering space at the Green at, on 38th Avenue in front of Stevens Elementary. 
The final design is now nearly complete and the construction is scheduled to begin on June 1st, 2024 when the school closes for summer break. Staff signed a non-binding letter of intent with the Jefferson County School District, which set forth the terms under which the district would convey the property necessary for the green to the city in exchange for the city constructing a new parking lot for Stevens Elementary. The terms of the letter of intent have been incorporated into a contract to buy and sell real estate. Thank you. So this will be a, um, a motion of the council. It is not quasi-judicial. Mr. Goff, do we have a staff presentation on this item? We do. Thank you. That'll keep my presentation even shorter. <clears throat> Good. Very good. Uh, as Ms. Hoppe uh, summarized, uh, the Jeff Jefferson School District has agreed uh, to convey the property necessary for the green project, which you see on your screen here um, tonight, um, to the city in exchange for the city constructing and paying for the school parking lot, um, which is estimated at just under $1.4 million. Your next item on the agenda is to approve a contract for the parking lot. <clears throat> the city will own and maintain the green, which is approximately 1.6 acres, and the school district will own and operate the parking lot. The contract requires several things. One is that the city um, will cause the property to be separately platted from the parking lot um, within 90 days of tonight's approval. That process is underway. The contract requires that the city enter into an IGA with the school district to memorialize uh, these conditions in the contract and stipulate shared use parameters for the parking lot in the future. Contract um, will also require that the city continue to operate the green for park purposes, and park purposes is defined in the contract. Uh, if not, the property will be deeded back to um, Jefferson County Open Space, and if Jefferson County Open Space fails to maintain the property, the park, for park, park purposes, the property will be deeded back to the school district. Um, the staff is currently working, or has worked with, um, or is working to, towards decommissioning the town center park, which is in the Safeway. Um, shopping center as that park is no longer functional for today's needs the Jefferson County Open Space Board approved the transfer of the reverter that was on, on the town center park to the green just last week the Jeffsco school board approved um, this contract in front of you tonight at their March 14th um, meeting Jeff Gatlin um, in the back here is the uh, COO for the school district he's here to uh, help answer any questions that you may have. Um, the Jefferson County School District has been a really, really great partner in this project. I would like to specifically thank Jeff for helping us get this um, past the finish line tonight. So with that, um, that's all we got. Mr. Dahl, do you have anything to add on the contract? Mr. Dahl helped um, with the contract. There was some tricky language in there on the reverter, so we can, we're here to answer any questions that you may have on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have no members of the public to speak on this, so I'll go right to questions from Council. Are there any questions of council of staff on this item? We did, we did have a detailed discussion about this at study session a couple weeks ago. So if we people did, are listening, we, we talked this, uh, that may be why council does have any questions, but that's right. We've we'll, talked this not yeah. to death, but to life. So we did. Anyways, <laughs> um, Councilor Hoppy, may I have a motion on this item? <laughs> I move to approve a contract to buy and sell real estate from Jefferson County School District for the green at 38. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second by Councillor Dozman. Uh, is there a discussion on the motion? Uh, Councillor Hoppe. I just want to say thank you to Jefferson County School District and staff for working together to bring this project to fruition. It's been something that we've been working towards for a very long time. Um, it's been a lot of baby steps, but this piece seals the deal, and I'm very excited for it to be happening. So thank you. Councillor Holteen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just really want to recognize everyone who worked to make this happen. I want to thank Council Member Hoppy for really pushing for the um, land exchange because I know one of the concerns was us not actually having control of the land. So this is in District 2 and something that we are just incredibly excited and proud that that is going to be coming together. And I just know that, you know, between our staff and my peers and the school district, it's taken a lot. And I cannot wait to see the shovels hit the ground. Um, I do have a question about the parking lot, but I'll save that for the next thing. But I'm just really excited and it can't come fast enough. But um, starting June 1st is, uh, sounds good to me. So thank you everyone for all your hard work on it. Okay. Councilor Dozman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and thank you to all of the partners that worked together to strike a deal in this land exchange. So one of my biggest concerns was that we, that the city of Wheat Ridge would not own this property and be able to maintain it. Um, and so I just really appreciate everybody's diligence and perseverance in this. And uh, I really appreciate the fact that we will own that land. Um, and I'm sure the reverter clause was very challenging, but glad to see um, that park 
Town Center Park being decommissioned um, and potentially being put to better use in the future as well. So thank you for everything. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stites. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I also want to thank staff and, and thank Jeffco for, for their hard work with this and uh, uh, Councillor Hoppy especially, but uh, everybody on council who's who supported this all the way through. Um, and this is kind of an example of making sure that you stay in that conversation for a long period of time because this has been one of those projects that's kind of gotten better and better and and uh, you know a lot of people probably would have ended this a long time ago. So um, it's glad I'm glad that we stayed in there and as a business owner who has a, a lot of gatherings. I'm excited to use this space and, and really try to activate that and, and drive businesses to, uh, or drive more business out to 38th and, and uh, strengthen our tax base. That's what it's here for. So thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, would the clerk please poll the council? All eyes, no nays. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we will turn to agenda item number three. Uh, Councillor Ohm, would you please introduce this item? Thank you, Mayor. Motion to award the green at 38th Project Phase 1 Stevens Elementary Parking Lot Replacement to ECI Site Construction Management Incorporated of Lovin, Colorado, and approve subsequent payment in the amount of $1,386,590 at issue, a project to create an urban park along 30th Avenue between Upham Street and High Court was budgeted several years ago. Staff recommends awarding a contract to ECI Site Construction Management Incorporated of Loveland, Colorado, in the amount of $1,386,590. This contract is associated with the first phase of construction, which includes the Stevens Elementary parking lot. Thank you. This will be a motion of the council. It is uh, not quasi-judicial. Stop. We have a staff presentation on this side. Again, very short. Um, we did talk at length about this a couple weeks ago, but um, as Mr. Ohm said, the inception of the Green Project uh, started many years ago, back in, um, as far back as 20, 2005 with the Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy. And it's been supported ever since in, in many, many planning documents, um, really to help create a sense of place in Wheat Ridge. Um, Consensus was reached back in 2018 by council to move forward with the community engagement process. There was a lot of community engagement. I'd like to thank Brandon Altenberg of our Parks and Rec Department, who really um, took this project under his wing and reached out to the community, the school district, um, the parents, the kids, um, to get their input on, this pro on the design process. We've now reached that final phase and are scheduled to cons start construction June 1st, as Ms. Hoppy, or, um, Ms. Um, Hultine mentioned. Um, and second phase will start shortly thereafter. Once the, once the parking lot is done, the parking lot has to be done in time for school to open by the 1st of August of this year. Um, and again, you can see the illustration on the, your screen here. It's a, it's a really a, an events, event park, uh, a park for, for passive use for people to take their kids, to have lunch. Um, so you can see there's gonna, on the west end, there is a very, um, a nice significant significantly sized stage and outdoor classroom that the school can also use um, we'll have many of our events there festival promenade that runs across the park um, for food trucks and um, event tents and other other things that um, you'd see pop up in a park um, community gathering space that has um, some tiered seating structures fire pits ping pong tables cornhole and lounge seating a playground and another uh, seating area with um, game tables and crusher finds. And uh, so really a diverse park that can be used for many different purposes. So very excited about the final design. And it will also improve the streetscape along 30th Avenue um, from Upham to High Court, essentially extending what was, was, was built in front of the apartments at 38th, um, uh, the 38th Avenue apartments just next door. Um, the project was uh, originally seeded um, clear back in, in 2017, I believe, 2018, but with about $900,000 from the general fund to start the community engagement and design process. Total design costs to date um, are $522,000. The total project budget um, with design is estimated at about $7.6 million. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Brandon Altenberg with our Parks and Rec Department has um, acquired, um, I don't have the number in front of me, it's in your packet, but close to $3 million worth of grants. Um, I think since we met last, we did just receive confirmation that we did receive another $250,000 grant from the um, Colorado Department of Transfer, or CDOT, right? Is it CDOT? Yeah, CDOT grant. So very happy about that. Um, 
Ted Johnson, um, our construction manager, general contractor with ECI, is here this evening. If you have any questions, um, he can help answer any of those. But with that, we'll open up for questions. Okay. Thank you very much. I have no members of the public signed up to speak on this item, so we'll close our public's right to speak and go to questions from council. Councillor Hilteen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I'm looking at the the pedestrian crossing element of the of the parking lot. And I'm wondering if there are plans for that to be an elevated crosswalk that has the little bit of hump that forces the cars to slow down. Um, there are increasing just really horrible stories of kids getting run over in parking lots because they're just smaller than the big trucks. Um, and those those elevated humps just require cars to drive slowly through there. This is now a pretty long elongated um, parking lot and which would you know when it's not completely backed up with drop off and pick up line which we're all familiar with it can be a nightmare um but that's just an extra safety enhancement to ensure that cars are driving at a, a safe and respectful speed so um, i'm just wondering if that is part of the design and plan Yeah, uh, thank you, Council. Again, uh, Ted Johnson with ECI. Um, specifically related to that, I do know um, as far as visualization effects, we do have um, colored concrete. I'll need to double check with our uh, uh, design team on that. But typically, there will have to be a uh, basically a visual um, delineation, and we do have concrete. I know uh, some buff colored concrete in a few different areas. Um, Again, I'll have to double check with the the design team on that. Okay, if if there's room in the budget, you know, this is a crosswalk that is guaranteed to be flush with kids in it, mm -hmm. um, and so by doing an elevated crosswalk that just is like a truncated dome, um, you know, it's not substantial cost, but it would be a significant safety enhancement to ensure that the cars traveling through that parking lot are not a risk for kids using the crosswalk. Yeah, I'll go and uh, I'll double check with our our team. I do know there's a contingency carried within this as well. Um, I would be, I've, our past experience, I'd be surprised if there wasn't a delineated and or raised um, curb specifically in that spine right there. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Councilor Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> it's actually not about the parking lot, but it just kind of dawned on me. Like the community, the community gathering space, would that be, would that be something that our community would be able to like rent, kind of like how they can rent our pavilions in our other parks or reserved? Um, we have discussed that. We don't have any final determination on that yet. Um, yeah, so we'll have to look at how everything falls together. But um, yes, yeah, certainly a consideration. Thanks. Great, thanks. Additional questions for staff on this item before we go to a motion. Seeing none, uh, Councillor Ome, I have a motion on agenda item number three. Thank you, Mayor. I move to award the green at 38th Avenue phase one project to ECI Site Construction Management Incorporated and approve subsequent payment in the amount of $1,386,590. Second. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second by Councillor Holteen. Is there a discussion on the motion? Councillor, start Mayor Pro Tem Stites. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and again, I just want to thank staff um, and everybody who worked on this project. Again, um, kind of at the the eleventh hour, uh, I got, and I guess everybody else got calls and emails from parents and and community members and uh, people who were involved at, uh, at Stevens, really worried about the design of the parking lot and how it was laid out and and the traffic flow. And um, I was envisioning this would be kind of a troublesome. A uh, problem for us, but uh, the staff jumped in and redesigned it and uh, worked with the school district. So, um, with with no problem. So, really appreciate the staff and and the school district for for working and listening to the community, listening to what the parents and the the administration over at Stevens was looking for. So, thank you again. This is a great project. Thank you, Councilor Ohm. I'd like to just echo Mayor Pro Tem State's comments and thank you, staff. Um, Councilor Holtine. Thank you. Um, so this is a mixed 
bag of a comment. Um, I do really appreciate that the city staff and the district were really responsive when we heard from community members associated with the school who really wanted to see that that additional access point on high court. Um, I, I, I actually have some concerns about it. Um, that is a, it's a, I've done a lot of drop off and pick up and there is congestion and having two points of entry um, can make for challenging uh, merging. The buses are gonna be there, the kids are gonna be there. So I just, as, as this comes online and as school comes back in session, I just want us to be really mindful and observant of how traffic is operating there. We have constituents both on Upham and High Court who've expressed a lot of concern about traffic backups, um, you know, really creating some congestion that don't allow cars or kids to move through there, in particular on High Court. So um, it, it's the right thing for us to have done, but we also really need to just keep our eye on how that impacts the traffic flow, especially on High Court where we've got the, you know, constrained visual constrained right away. And that's where they don't have a lot of buses, but they have some. So when this comes online, uh, you know, it'd be good for us to be doing some observations. And then as we continue to build out the green, just really looking at how are people moving through 38th Avenue, High Court, and Upham, and, you know, what kind of safety enhancements do we have to do to make sure that people are, are moving safely through there? Because a lot of them are little people. Um, so just want to register that, that now. And um, I know we do a good job of that, but um, I've really put a lot of thought into it and actually sat and kind of watched some traffic behavior through there without the curb cut and it's um, it's gonna it's gonna create some behavior issues so we should be mindful and observant of that when the time comes thank you uh, thank you councillor Snell thank you mr. mayor just uh, echoing my colleagues uh, thanks to the staff for all the hard work and and uh, listening to feedback um, I also want to recognize the several community members that did reach out as um, mayor pro tem Stites, uh mentioned about the traffic patterns and, and yes that I, I agree will be a concern but also um i received some requests um to preserve as many trees as possible being a tree city um i am grateful very grateful also for the consideration that was given to that and the thoughtfulness around that so um again kudos this is going to be a, a wonderful thing for our community so thank you thank you uh councillor weaver I simply wanted to echo that sentiment as well and thank everyone for their work on this. Um, but if we can preserve as many of those mature trees that we have growing there, it would be really lovely since they are interesting in shape and size. Thank you. Okay, I see no more discussion on the motion. So would the uh, clerk please poll the council? All eyes, no nays. Motion carries. Thank you. That will bring us to agenda item number four. Uh, Councillor Weaver, would you please introduce this item? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a motion to award a contract and approve subsequent payments to Barry Dunn, McNeil, and Parker, LLC, in the amount not to exceed $249,999 for professional services for the Parks and Recreation Master Plan update. Why don't you go ahead and read the okay. issue statement? At issue, the city has determined that it is time to update the, par update the Park and Recreation Master Plan. This decision is supported by the CRPA, the Commission for the Accreditation of Park and Recreation Agencies, recommendation for updating the document, recommendation for updating, of updating the document every 10 years. Funds were previously budgeted for this update, and the city is seeking cons consultant services to compete this plan to complete this plan update for a total cost not to exceed $249,999. On March 14th, 2024, the firm Barry Dunn was selected by the city's established procurement process to perform the required professional services for completion of the Parks and Recreation Master Plan update. Thank you. This will be a motion of the council. It is not quasi-judicial. Mr. Goff, do we have a staff presentation on this side? A brief one from Karen O'Donnell, our Parks and Rec Director. Okay. Director O'Donnell. 
Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. I just wanted to mention that we did have um, the competitive procurement process as mentioned in the Council Action Forum. Um, we had three wonderful firms apply, so it was a, a difficult process, but ultimately we went with the team that scored the highest both in their written propo proposal and their interview. And what I wanted to mention that one of the things that really stood out is their creative approach to community engagement. So we're really excited about reaching all of our community members from young to old and everyone in between, um, those who are not currently being served by our parks and recreation services and those who are. So um, really looking forward to that uh, kicking off next month and um, we're really excited to have such a great firm on board. So I just wanted to share that, thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. I have no members of the public uh, signed up to speak on this so we will conclude that portion and go to questions from council. Uh, Councillor Dozman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, could staff just speak to how the Parks and Rec master plan and then also the economic um, development plan kind of play into comprehensive plan and how those pieces all kind of move together? Sure. Um, I'm not sure that I recall the, the timeline, but I know Lauren's team really uh, was very thoughtful about that as the city plan was the first one to come on board and brought all of us together th that are working on different plans like the Parks and Recreation Master Plan, the Stormwater Plan, the um, um, economic, economic development. development Plan. There's so many plans happening at the same time to really determine how we could um, tackle these things together as a team to most effectively engage our community both online and in our public meetings and kind of looking at those dates and how we can um, tag team and, and approach the community together. Uh, so we're really looking at it collectively, but ultimately there's different goals and outcomes to each plan that we're, we're seeking to achieve. So for Parks and Recreation Master Plan, it's really like the legacy. What does the next 10 years look like for our community and what are those priorities? Yeah, and this is really just to add to that real quickly. Um, Karen did a great job explaining that, but this is kind of phase two of our Let's Talk program. Um, so let's let's talk stormwater. Let's talk trash. Yeah. Let's talk parks. Let's talk parks. Let's talk sustainability. So um, it's it's a continuation of that engagement process that we had. Thank you. Additional questions from staff before staff. Uh, seeing none, Councillor Weaver, may I have a motion on this item? Uh, you may, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I move to award a contract and approve subsequent payment to Barry Dunn McNeil and Parker LLC in the amount not to exceed $200,049,999 for professional services for the Parks and Recreation Master Plan update. Second. We have a motion and a second by Councillor Ohm. Is there discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please poll the council? All eyes, no nays, the motion carries. Thank you very much. With that, we will go to agenda item number five. Mayor Pro Tem Stites, would you please introduce this item? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Motion to award the Stormwater Master Plan Project to Res Respic Company LLC of Denver, Colorado, and approve subsequent payments in the amount of $189,755 with a contingency amount of $10,245 for a total not to exceed amount of $200,000. At issue, the city experienced a series of stormwater sewer pipe failures in 2023. It was determined that an increased level of investment in maintenance, repairs, and upgrades to the system is necessary to provide adequate protection to life, safety, and property. A previous stormwater master plan was created in 1979. Let me say that again, 1979, sorry. <laughs> Since that time, minimal planning and analysis has been completed. Therefore, a comprehensive evaluation is required. The plan will provide an assessment of current system development of immediate and future needs along with recommendation for improvements, a capital plan, and an implementation schedule. This effort will also include an evaluation of the stormwater utility fee for the community, optional pricing, is being sought for review and recommendations for the city's current development standards related to the drainage and runoff. Thank you. This will be a motion of the council. It is not quasi-judicial. Mr. Goff, we have a staff presentation on this yeah. item. Yeah, I'll turn it over to Maria here, our public works director. I know this is a high priority for her, and there's many good reasons for that. I'll let her explain. Director DeAndrea. Thank you. 
Yes, uh, even as we speak, we're experiencing additional uh, storm sewer maintenance issues out in our network as a result of our heavy snows over the last couple of weeks. Um, we're really excited to bring this forward as we've talked over numerous occasions, including our retreat over a year ago. And since then, as some of these projects have come about, um, the city really is due to relook at our entire stormwater management program comprehensively. And the, the um, actual plan update that will be done by RESPEC is one element of that. So not only um, looking at planning and prioritization of our capital uh, needs, but also from a maintenance perspective, how we operate the system, uh, the needs there, as well as overall capital investment, financing, and then as we mentioned, development standards. So we cannot solve all those problems alone. As new development occurs, we also need them to be partners and take care of their own water quality and detention requirements. So we did, uh, the team that evaluated the proposals did choose respect. They received the highest overall rating from each one of the team members that reviewed the proposals. And they prepared more than 30 other stormwater uh, master plans for other communities along the Front Range and throughout Colorado. They also have extensive experience preparing uh, community design criteria and those standards. So we feel that we're in really good um, hands with them and look forward to completing this project over the next several months so that we can inform the 2025 budget process. Thank you. Um, I have no uh, members of the public signed up to speak on this item, so we will close that portion of our uh, item and go to questions from Council. Uh, uh, Councilor Dozman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Director DeAndre, could you speak a little bit more to um, including an evaluation of a stormwater utility fee for the community? Is that just whether they would recommend that or not, or can you talk a little bit more about that detail? Yes. So the intent really is, um, once we identify those needed repairs, that that will cost a certain amount. Right now, we do not have a, a dedicated funding source for stormwater. And so the likely method to fund those projects would come through a stormwater utility. So yes, RESPECT's analysis will be is what is that need, both from an operational and uh, maintenance and capital investment, and then how do we uh, go about achieving that and the stormwater utility might be one of those methods to achieve that. Additional uh, questions from staff? Uh, Councillor Larson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wonder if we could describe, uh, th there's a discussion in the proposal um, to, disc to prioritize repair and uh, replacement needs. <clears throat> um, what would the criteria for that be? Would, would the um, failing uh, stormwater drains not be a priority or um, would there be a more of a sort of a systemic approach to, to uh, these sort of repairs? Because I would think uh, stormwater uh, drain failures would be uh, among the priorities. Certainly, um, and probably one of the primary considerations will be how it affects uh, private property, life and safety. So if there are properties that are impacted um, to the point where perhaps there could be um, flooding of homes or businesses or other structures, that would probably receive a higher priority because then there's the potential for impacts, um, both to life and to the property. So it'd be, that would be our initial criteria, but also yes, um, not only failed sections, but sections that are deteriorated and or sections that need to be enlarged. So um, the, P the system as it was has not been studied comprehensively. And so there may be portions of the city where we need to enlarge or add segments as well. And so that will go into the, to the mix as to how much we protect various parts of the community and where we need to do that. So it may be replacement or upgrades or just new altogether. Can can you um, can you help me understand a little bit better how um, when we're talking about uh, stormwater repair um, and the, again it gets back to this utility fee that we, we we're hearing about but we also have money that's been um, that the voters have approved uh, in two J uh, how are we differentiating those two um, funds certainly yes. Um, a portion of the 2J funds will be used for drainage improvements. 
However, um, having done this with other communities of similar size and age, we anticipate that the cost overall over the next 10 to 15 years will exceed probably in the range of 100 or more million dollars. That's far more than what's available completely within the 2J. So we will attack probably the first prioritizations with the 2J funds, knowing that the longer term funding aspect will come potentially through this utility fee. Thank you. And um, there is also discussion in, the, uh, in their proposal about um, describing how uh, Weavers will manage uh, the growth that's anticipated to happen. Um, because when we think about um, new development, it is, uh, the approach would be uh, fairly different than what we have existing. Um, what would that involve? What would that uh, sort of analysis of how stormwater and, and, and drainage can be managed in conjunction with anticipated growth? Yes, so um, the Mile High Flood District has standards that they've established, and we are be, we're going to be looking at our development code in relation to Mile High Flood District standards to see that where they align or don't align so that we can better um, m match them. That is the standard that's been set over generally the metro area, the area that Mile High um, covers, and so we want to make sure that we're in conjunction or that we're working in conjunction with them making sure we're meeting that, and then using private property, not just pushing that problem out into the right-of-way or into other properties that they have to deal with their own drainage um, when that property is redeveloped. So, so this would be more of a, um, uh, a not a single lot at a time, more of a block-by-block -block, uh, overview? Um. Yeah, more of site-by-site -site as a new development comes into um, comes through the planning process, then we would address it with them and have them meet those standards and criteria. And, and in another area, there is a mention of uh, possibly updating some of the, um, the codes and the standards that the city has. Um, wouldn't that be something that would automatically come along with this? Or, because it doesn't sound like it's a, it's a, a sure thing. Oh, I think we were unsure about the budget a little bit, so that's why we made it an optional task. Um, we were going to try and attack that internally, maybe. Um, this allows us, with some very key expertise who have done this before, and we were able to match or able to um, achieve that within the allotted budgeted amount. So we're going forward with that. That will be included. It, it will, oh, yes. Good, good. That, that's mm -hmm. certainly good news. Mm -hmm. And then um, the. There's mention that uh, th these, the contractor um, respec is uh, very familiar with, and they have a lot of success with uh, community outreach and and um, sort of taking the pulse of the of the public. Um, I, I I don't know. I I guess I'd, I'd have to see that to believe it, um, with knowing how surveys can sometimes. Um, not adequately uh, fulfill what their, their the goals are, but um, it, it does sound like that that at least that's that's part of what they're proposing. Yes, um, we'll be utilizing the What's Up Wheat Ridge page. So instead of creating something new or different, we want to drive people to that page that they may already be familiar with that has the opportunity to give feedback, um, allow for surveys and other project data to already be placed on there. And we have collected... Um, over the last several years, you know, when we've had larger rain events, we've received a lot of phone calls and emails from stat, or from various citizens about problem areas, and that will be one of the focus points: is making sure that we're following up with them, um, that we're addressing all of those to determine, um, so that they don't need to reach out to us again. I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I would, yes, I would encourage um, that sort of outreach because mm -hmm. we. We know where the problem areas are, um, so I would think that if there was some way to, uh, I'm not saying knock on doors, but but at least uh, contact a, a representative sample of people in that neighborhood uh, that have had the experience with um, with stormwater issues. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. and get that sort of real life uh, experience. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's all Thank the questions you. I have there. Thank you, uh, Councilor Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to go back a little bit and just make sure, um, because I have one of these properties, and there are many in Wheat Ridge that have no stormwater drainage. Mm -hmm. 
And um, so there's no one to call when, you know, I go out with a hoe and open up the um, conduit underneath my driveway, or I have a flooded house. And I just wanted to make sure that in the gathering of information, do people like me need to say, hey, I don't have any drainage, or is that going to be prioritized the people who have no drainage are looked at because in, in other words, I'm not calling the city because there are no pipes to complain about. <laughs> sure. And, um, and so it, it's, and I, and I know I'm not the only one in that situation. So I'm just curious how you will prioritize those properties who are not necessarily knowing that they even have a drainage. I mean, they know they have a drainage problem, but they're they're not understanding that this is part of a larger plan. Can you just speak a little bit to that? Thank you. Certainly. Yeah, so um, I think the way that we word that and how we do that outreach, so we'll be involving our communications team um, in that. I think, you know, uh, one of the reasons we also chose Respect was that they have a lot of experience with ditches. So that can pose its own um, unique challenges as we talked about in that utility uh, presentation we did a, several months ago. So I think um, any time you know, that there is flooding of property, we want to make sure that it's not really, doesn't need to be tied to storm sewer. That may just indicate the need for storm sewer. So it's really about, is it impacting your property? Is it impacting um, you in some way that we want to hear from you? And then we, we will figure out um, through engineering methods to determine what's the right solution to solve that and how we go about prioritizing those repairs. Again, whether we need more pipe, new pipe, larger pipes, or some other method to address that. I, I just want to follow up with one quick question. So will those people have to reach out or will you actually go through the GIS and look at who doesn't have mm. stormwater? Thank you. Yes, they, they have... Um, they can do a very, and one of the aspects is this hydraulic and hydrologic um, mapping that they'll do. Mm -hmm. It's pretty high level, but we can use data through, again, the Mile High Flood District to look at that from a pretty high level to identify where there's the potential for flooding. Now, that's not down necessarily to each individual property, but general areas where we can start to say, hey, there's something going on here because they have elevation data and they have rainfall data and they've already done some of that work. So they'll be looking at that more specifically, yes. Thank you. Additional questions from uh, staff or council of staff? Seeing none, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stites, may I have a motion on this item? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to award the Stormwater Master Plan Project to Respect Company, LLC, and approve subsequent payments in the amount of $189,755 with a contingency amount of $10,245 for a total not to exceed amount of $200,000. Second. We have a motion and a second by uh, Councillor Hoppe. Is there discussion on the motion? Uh, Councillor um, Larson. Larson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and uh, it, calling something overdue, I guess, would be an understatement here. Uh, this, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that this thing is, is getting off the ground. I know that when, when I was out before the election and knocking on doors and talking to some of my neighbors, um, and you could see in their eyes the, um, the concern they had. Of, uh, they've seen it happen. They've seen it happen over and over again. And, and uh, they really want... Uh, the city of Wheatridge to do something about this. And it sounds like we are moving in the right direction. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stites. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to kind of echo what uh, Councilor Larson just said. I believe that the last time that this plan was updated, my grandfather was the mayor. So um, that was a long time ago. Um, and I wasn't born yet, by the way. So, um, so that's, a, that's a long time. Um, and last year, I think we saw directly in District 3, District 4, and District 1, just off the top of my head, um, what uh, this has kind of led to. So this is something that we really need to tackle and, and get working on. So thank you for staff for bringing it forward, and, and I hope we get this done quickly. Thank you. I think no more discussion. Will the clerk please poll the council? All ayes, no nays, motion carries. Thank you. We will go to agenda item number six, and uh, I'm going to introduce this item. Uh, this is a motion to appoint members to boards and commissions, uh, the Community Partners Grant Program uh, Committee and Sustainable Wheat Ridge uh, at issue 
uh, council appoints members to the city boards and commissions annually as needed throughout the year to fill vacancies. There are three boards and commission appointments to consider at this time. And I'm going to uh, recognize Councillor Hoppy to make the motions for the District 1. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to appoint Amanda Rodriguez to fill the vacant District 1 position for the Board of Adjustment, term to expire March 1, 2027. And I move to appoint Jeffrey Richards to the Community Partners Grant Program Committee, District 1 seat, term to expire February 28th, 2027. Do I have a second? Second. We have a second by Councillor Snell. Would the clerk please poll the council? I'm sorry. All eyes, no nays, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Holteen, would you uh, please make motions for district number two? Yeah, it'd be my pleasure. I move to appoint district three resident Lindsay Schwerman to the Community Partners Grant Program Committee, district two seat, term to expire February 28th, 2027, and district three resident Adam Wakefield to the Community Partners Grant Program Committee, district two seat, partial term to expire February 28th, 2025. We have a, we have a, a second by Councilor Ohm. Um, would the uh, clerk please poll the council? All ayes, no nays, motion carries. Thank you, bless you. Uh, Councilor Weaver, would you please uh, make the uh, motions for District 3? I move to appoint Ryan Schwerman Schwerman to the District 3 seat of the Sustainable Wheat Ridge Committee, term ending February 28th, 2027. Second. We have a motion and a second. Will the clerk please poll the council? All ayes, no nays. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dozman, would you please introduce the uh, motion for District 4? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to reappoint District 1 resident Brendan Kelly to the District 4 seat of the Cultural Commission, term to expire March 1st, 2027. And I move to appoint District 3 resident Rio O'Neill to the District 4 seat of the Community Partners Grant Program, term to expire February 28th, 2027. Second. We have a motion and a second. Would the clerk please poll the council? All, all eyes, no nays, motion carries. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Ohm, would you please make the motions for Sustainable Wheat Ridge? Thank you, Mayor. Move to ratify the staff nominate appointments of the Sustainable Wheat Ridge Committee as follows. Reappointment of Betsy Kopic of District 3 for an at-large position, term ending February 20, 2027. Appointment of Mike Stewart of District 2 for an at-large position, term ending February 28, 2027. Appointment of Connor Denton, non-resident representative for an at-large position, term ending February 28, 2027. Appointment of Amanda Birch of a District 2 for an at-large position, term ending February 28, 2027. Appointment of Sarah uh, Punasino of District 2 for an at-large position, term ending February 28, 2026. Second. We have a motion and a second by Councilor Holteen. Would the clerk please poll the council? All eyes, no nays, motion carries. Thank you very much. That will bring us to agenda item number seven. Councillor Dozman, would you please introduce this item? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Resolution number 14, 2024, a resolution in opposition to state legislation infringing upon home rule authority. At issue, the city's home rule authority was adopted by its voters in 1976 and is enshrined in the Colorado Constitution. The City Council may pass a resolution in opposition to state legislation infringing upon its home rule authority. As a result, elected officials and staff could oppose such le legislation on behalf of the city without returning to Council to discuss specific bills. Thank you. This will be a resolution of the Council. This is not quasi-judicial. Mr. Goff, we have a staff presentation on this item. We don't. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any, um, any questions from Council before we go to a motion? Councillor Holteen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> um, reading through the resolution, 
uh, one of the things we discussed is this is an automatic authority to take position on bills based on a singular aspect. And it is always possible that a bill we would otherwise support if, if, but for the home rule issue, such as like the ADU bill, um, if the home rule infringement were to get amended in the bill, um, is that, would staff be looking at possibly bringing bills back to us that we uh, previously took an opposed position on? Yeah, I, I, I don't see this resolution as given um, um, direct authority to oppose or deny any bill. I think there's nuance. Every bill is nuanced a bit. And I think if we're not 100% comfortable um, making a position, um, we're going to come back to council. Um, and if bills get amended all the time, as you mentioned, so I think it's going to be a bill by bill case and to, to determine if we need to come back or not. Okay. Thank you. Any other uh, questions before I go to a motion? Seeing none, uh, Councilor Dozum, may I have a motion on this item? I move to approve resolution number 14, 2024, a resolution in opposition to state legislation infringing upon home rule authority. We have a motion and a second by Mayor Pro Tem Stites. Is there a discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please poll the council? All ayes, no nays, the motion carries. Thank you. That will conclude our business portion of the meeting. Get back to my script here. And we will now go to uh, City Managers Matters. Mr. Gong. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a, a couple of quick things. First of all, a follow-up on our discussion on the, um, the parking lot. For the green, um, we are... I think to respond to Ms. Holtine's questions, um, we are conducting a full traffic study of the area. Um, there was a traffic study conducted a couple years ago for the departments, but um, there's been quite a bit changes in the area with um, 150, I think, new kids, parents coming to, um, to Stevens. So um, we are conducting a, a new traffic study to look at all the all the movements, pedestrian and cars in that area. Um, we, and we are saving um, some of the trees. I believe 16 of the trees are, will be saved. Um, some, some need to go because they are dying. They're not in very good shape. But um, the whole site is going to receive over 100 new trees. So um, in the end, there will be many more trees than they are there today. So, but we are trying to preserve a few, few that we can. Um, speaking of trees, we had uh, approximately 317 residents utilize our branch drop off um, this last Friday and Saturday at Collar Strand Elementary. I want to thank the, the school district again for allowing us to use that site. The site's now closed. We're going to be uh, mulching and um, chipping and mulching um, and hauling away tomorrow, hopefully, um, those, uh, those limbs. Um, Council or Congress approved another budget package um, over the weekend. And uh, in this budget package included our $200,000 request for the Clerk Creek Makerspace. So we're two for two in approvals this year for our congressionally directed spending. If you remember, we did get $200 million um, approved several weeks ago in a, a separate budget package for our affordable housing program. So we'll draft um, some thank you letters for our senators and, and congresswomen for council to sign and get those to them. So um, we do appreciate their... Uh, there's support for that. We are working on submitting applications for the fiscal year 25 program, um, and those are due this Friday. Um, and speaking of the makerspace, this reminder, this Saturday, there is a ribbon cutting for the Clear Creek makerspace at uh, 10 a.m. So excited about that new program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, City Attorney's Matters, Mr. Dahl. Nothing tonight, thank okay, you. Okay, thank you so much. We'll go to Elected Officials Matters and start with Councilor Holtine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, happiness Gardens, things are happening. Uh, when I was spending some time there this weekend, there were several community volunteers that were uh, cleaning up last year's goodies and making space for new things to grow. And these were just well-intended volunteers who care about how our community garden looks. And it was just great to see them out there. And um, it is a space where people come together to make good things happen. So really, Always grateful for Happiness Gardens. And then I just want to um, thank everyone who spoke tonight. Uh, we are only as, as good as the people who come and inform us what's important to them. And uh, I remember back when I was not on the dais and I was in the peanut gallery, and I was just always impressed with how warm and welcoming these chambers were. And in Wheat Ridge, when you come and share your thoughts, 
Uh, it's an attentive audience and we listen and we make things happen. So I just appreciate the civic space and uh, it's good to be here. And that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Snell. Thank you. Just a really quick uh, to echo um, City Manager Goff's uh, sentiments about the uh, limb drop off. I know a lot of my neighbors took advantage of that and that's just such a huge help for folks as we're trying to clean up. Um, and so I just wanted to echo that. Thank you. Uh, for allowing us to, to be able to drop off those limbs that were weighed down by all that snow. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Dozman. Thank you. I uh, was so very, very excited for the grand opening of the Clear Creek Makerspace uh, this weekend, March 30th, 11 to 2 at Anderson Park. Um, very, very excited to have that innovative space for our makers in the community and in District 4. So uh, I will definitely see you there with my kiddos. Um, and also wanted to just uh, echo a lot of thanks again to our staff um, in regards to undertaking taking a lot of these comprehensive plans that um, otherwise have been pretty archaic. Um, so not only have we seen a lot of uh, updates in our development code or building code, um, but now we're embarking on a comprehensive plan and looking at our economic development, our stormwater, parks and rec. Um, so it's just a really, really amazing time to be in the community. And I want to encourage everyone to come and have your voice heard, stay a part of those conversations. Um, as council member Stites had said, you know, that some of these conversations take years um, to come to fruition and so I really appreciate everybody's um, engagement and involvement and I think the city has done a wonderful job at reaching out and getting public input um, throughout all of these processes and and I've really been um, inspired and, and grateful for the way the community has showed up and uh, given their voices to how we want to see policy move forward in the future so thank you thank you sometimes decades uh, Councillor Larson. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I would like to remind the, uh, the folks back home that um, District 4, uh, Council Member Dozman and I will be hosting a community meeting April 2nd. That's this coming Tuesday. This is at uh, the Anderson Park building. Uh, at Anderson Park begins at 6 o'clock. We will have a presentation from our public information officer with the Wheat Ridge Police Department. We will have somebody from Lutheran there talking about uh, all the exciting things that's going on over there uh, and uh, maybe some prizes and no, I'm kidding. We're not going to give anything away. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe. Um, and, and then on a more of a personal note, um, I have a puppy. The puppy demands a dog, a, a dog walk every day and I walk around my neighborhood and Sometimes I get a little embarrassed with just litter. I know litter is one of those things that we don't want to really think about, but I just ask people, don't throw it out the window. Just wait till you get somewhere. The, 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 there's no reason to throw anything out of your car window uh, that somebody else has to pick up. Thank you. <laughs> Council Rome. Thank you, Mayor. Um, two things. One, um, I think Thank you, everybody, for your patience on 38th and, and Wadsworth. Um, and I'm grateful to staff for having that, that pedestrian access and Council Member Hall team for, for bringing that up. Um, I, you know, we're, I'm, I think everybody's counting down the days when we can reopen that again. And, and uh, I know it'll be worth the effort, uh, well worth the effort. And the other thing is um, my kids have informed me that Wheat Ridge High School is now undergoing some construction at the front, front entry, which I think will be good. For the high school so um thank you thank you uh councillor weaver thank you mr mayor uh we have a district three meeting at the rec center this saturday at nine at nine and then we're planning to go over to the makerspace yeah so come join us for district three uh i also want to thank uh the staff for dealing with the stormwater stuff um i also wanted to I want to come back to that in just a second, but uh, I wanted to let our Parks and Rec director know that I received high compliments specifically for the staff that was receiving the branches. They were extremely help helpful, and um, I, this person said they were going to call the city and compliment, um, but I just wanted to let you know that I heard that from several neighbors. Um, and I just want to, again, 
thank you for dealing with the stormwater. I'm very excited to live in a modern sewage, excuse me, not sewage, modern stormwater city. Having just spent a couple of weeks in South America, I just am very excited. <laughs> while I realize I'm farming in the back to be able to not have to um, uh, un unplug the big conduit in front of my house on 38th. So thanks everyone for thinking about stormwater tonight. You may actually have more drainage than less. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Um, Councillor Hoppy. Nothing tonight, Mayor, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Potem Stites. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, I want to thank uh, the staff for the limb drop off. Um, I live right by College Street, and it was kind of fun to watch that pile grow and grow and grow. I think it it looks like a heck of a bonfire or something it would be kind of fun out there. We roast marshmallows. Oh, wait, sorry, sorry, that's already happened. Oh, I'm I'm going back over. Um, but uh, it was fun to watch all weekend. Um, and then, uh, as Councilor Weaver said, the District 3 meeting is Saturday, uh, 9 a.m. at the rec center. Um, Lutheran's going to be there presenting. We'll have uh, Wheat Ridge PD stopping by. Um, Councilor Weaver and I are going to talk all about everything going on in the city. Um, and then I just also wanted to mention, there's a really cool movie on Netflix right now called Mile American. Um, people who went to Texas love it because it's a great story about a Texas kid. But it's really a story about a kid from Wheat Ridge. And there's some great scenes from Wheat Ridge. Uh, but Freddie Steinmark, which is the uh, Freddie Steinmark Award given out every year, um, was a Wheat Ridge student. And uh, it's a fantastic movie. You will ball at the end of it. Um, absolutely ball. But uh, um, fantastic movie. Great scenes from Wheat Ridge in there, too. So check it out. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take a moment to recognize a Wheat Ridge business that's been here a long time. Beauty Inc. is a hair salon located at 44th and J, and they're celebrating their 60th anniversary this week. Uh, we, uh, Beauty Inc. moved to Wheat Ridge in 1981 after many years in North Denver. Uh, a local resident, D. Uh, Lombardi, uh, was the owner of Beauty Inc. in North Denver and moved it to Wheat Ridge, where she was a resident. She was a shop owner since 1964 and was very successful with uh, having one of the oldest and uh, old, maybe oldest women-owned businesses in the city uh, for a long time. The city was famous for its warm and friendly culture and, uh, and really supporting its clients. Uh, they had over 40 stylists through, through the six decades. And uh, Dee uh, sadly passed away in 2021, and her children have run, it, run the business uh, until now, but now it's time to close the business, and they just wanted to uh, have a have a really a word of, of uh, thanks for her and, and her contributions to our community. So thank you very much to Beauty Inc. and uh, Dee Lombardi. Uh, I got to say, I was at the Easter egg hunt at Anderson Park on Saturday, and if you haven't been there, that's one of the best events that we put on in the year. There, there's so much excitement and activity and, and uh, people just having a great time from from, you know, you, you're still swinging in your mother's arms uh, through, through the great-grandparent phase and a lot of great stuff. I want to really thank the staff that we had there. We have really an engaged Parks and Recreation Department that really put that on and, and the Director O'Donnell's here and you did a great job. And I'll tell you, I just, I used to get, my, my, my lips hurt from the amount of smiling I do. I want to, I want to tell you that. So anyway, that's, it was great. Uh, I want to, uh, I'm really excited that we've got the, the uh, green at 38th going forward. I've, we've got our contractor here, and I want to really wish you a lot of success and, and a good hard work to get that done for us. We're really looking forward to that. As you can tell, it's been a long time in the making. Speaking of making, we've got the makerspace open, and I want to give a really a shout-out to Local Works. I think they've really done a great job, not only on this project, but on a lot of things going on. They've got great leadership, and I want, I want to really recognize their uh, their contributions to our community. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Scott Peak for coming in and talking to us tonight about what's going on at the Lutheran Legacy Campus. This is a huge opportunity for our community to uh, to really look at the next chapter. You know, we're doing these planning studies now to to set the framework for the next chapter. If you've heard that before, in our uh, in our city's history, and we've really got a lot of great energy and great people running that running those. Uh, organizations and, and uh, programs, and it's really, um, it's, it's really up to our citizens to come and tell us what you want, it, what you want in our plans. It's really, we want to be open and transparent and seeking input because we, we make better decisions when we listen to all sides of the, of the, of the opinion. So uh, thanks very much for, for bringing that forward. Um, 
we have a special study session that's going to happen upon adjournment on of this meeting and we will be back here next week i believe for a um, study session so if there's no uh, more business to come before council we will uh, stand adjourn and just take about uh, five minutes break and then we'll go into our special study session so thank you all very much
Okay, I would like to call to order a special study session for the City Council for the City of Wheat Ridge for March 25th, 2024. Uh, we have uh, two uh, action or study items on our agenda. Number one is land acquisition process for the Ward Transit Station area, pedestrian bridge and trail. And item number two is a 2024 building code update. Uh, I have no one signed up to speak from the public, so we will move past that on our program and go to Mr. Gaw. I'm going to turn it right over to Maria DeAndrea, our Public oh. Works Director. Okay, Director DeAndrea. Yes, thank you. Mayor and City Council, so we're going to just do an informational session for the most part tonight and talk about land acquisition. So this project has been um, uh, in front of Council before, but we do have some new Council members um, over the past few years. This was kind of uh, brought up initially back in 2019, so here we are five years later. There was a period where we put it on hold during the COVID uh, period, and now we're, we're reinvigorating it, starting it again, and moving towards construction. So the land acquisition process, we want to familiarize all of council with that because there may be a time when we need to come back where we have some difficult parcels that we cannot acquire, and we may need to move to more extreme measures uh, when we do that. So tonight, again, is just about kind of giving you an overview of the project and how the land acquisition process will lay out. This slide just shows you a little bit of the project overall. So the green there over the railroad tracks would be the pedestrian bridge that we will build. So that will land on the north side of the, of the tracks um, near the existing drop-off and RTD transit station. We'll travel to the south. There'll be another landing point on the south side there of 49th Avenue. And then the red depicts the, the trail that will be built down to the I-70 frontage road where we'll construct a marked crosswalk with a raised median and the pedestrian um, beacon flashing lights at that location. Um, so I mentioned all that. This is ADA accessible, so there'll be both stairways and elevators on each side of the bridge. The bridge will be elevated about 30 feet in the air to make allow for the train passage underneath. Um, and as I mentioned, there'll be landscape plazas on either side, as well as public art on the bridge itself and in that area. Really, the purpose of this project is to provide a safer crossing for those rail tracks. As um, we've heard in other situations around the metro area, as well as other parts of the country, um, pedestrians can often get caught between railroad crossings in various ways, get caught on the tracks, as well as vehicles, and this really provides for the much safer crossing of that, especially from the south side of the rail tracks. So this allows for all types of non-vehicular access up and over the rail tracks to that RTD rail station. And it really reduces the um, travel distance for all of those uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, et cetera. Right now they would have to go out to either Ward or to Tabor Street and go around or across at the grade crossing of the railroad tracks. This way they're traveling roughly about three quarters of a mile less distance. So the land needed for the project, we have 14 um, separate parcels from various property owners. Of those, nine are right away, seven are permanent easement and seven are temporary easement. So one parcel might have a couple of those on them where we need both the right of way as well as just a temporary easement so that we can construct the project. That after construction is over, those temporary easements get, uh, basically go back to the property owner and we no longer need them. So it's just for the, during the period of construction that we're required to have those temporary easements. And then we're planning right now is to vacate a portion of city right of way. And I'll show you that on the map here, just going back to that real quick. Um, that's near that 49th Avenue where the drop-off point is. We're actually moving this a little bit um, further to the west and some of this land can be turned back to the adjacent property owner to limit the impacts that we're having on their property. Okay. So again, just kind of as an overview, because this is... Um, uh, there are federal funds involved. We are required to follow the Uniform Relocation Assistance Act that was enacted uh, back in 1970 originally and then amended in 1987. 
And that's a, really the purpose of that is to ensure that property owners and their tenants are treated fairly and equitably. So oftentimes, you know, there's um, a feeling perhaps that we're coming in and just taking it, taking it, you know, with uh, trying to get a deal, if you will. And there are processes that have been set up through the federal government specifically for transportation projects through the Federal Highway Administration that we're required to follow to ensure that they're treated um, fairly. So these are the, just the rough steps to go through. Um, back in 2019, staff did go out and meet with all of the property owners and talk about the project. And generally, they were, that was very well received. So especially along the trail portion, which is a very steep slope, again, on that red line, um, by perhaps uh, we'll at least ask the question, would they be willing to donate the land to us? Um, what that gives them is reduced property uh, taxes, of course, because they're removing that property from the point that they have to sell it, and all, as well as maintenance. So there are some benefits to that. However, we are required to let them know that they, are, they can be um, compensated for that. But we'll see, we're gonna take that as a first step. Then we go through the process of actually informing them what, the, what we feel is the value for their property. So we get any pro, um, land that's valued over about $25,000, we will go out and hire an appraiser and actually do an appraisal of that property. And then we will send that letter to them, notifying them that we intend to acquire this property. It's now been five years since we first made that uh, initial outreach. And we will share in that letter that city appraisal, what, our, what we feel is the fair market value, and then start to that negotiation process. So we give them, um, I'll talk about the incentives in just a minute, but we give them that initial offer and say, hey, you know, we'd like to come talk to you, explain the process, and then begin those negotiations to the point where we're trading information, we're updating them, we're answering all of their questions, and then hopefully, reaching an area where we can have a final offer um, and where they would accept that and that we have received the land. If we aren't successful, then we'll talk about the eminent domain process in just a minute. So again, really our overall goal is to make sure that we're entering into good faith negotiations that result in hopefully a consensual agreement, that they feel that they've been treated fairly and that they're being compensated fairly for that property. In our initial negotiations, the real estate specialists meet and talk with the landowners. Um, and again, it's really just a, talking about, you know, how that offer comes to be, the appraisal process. We also um, allow them to get, a counter, or get an appraisal of their own that we have to pay for. If they don't feel like ours is fair, they can um, certainly take uh, advantage of that. We can also offer them, and we're planning to do this, we did this on Wadsworth, is offer an incentive. So we up the price and our, what we feel is the fair market value, up it a little bit to say, if you sign within 30 days, we'll give you this much more on the property. And what that does, it reduces our costs, it ensures that we're getting that property and they feel like they're getting a little bit better deal out of that. We can also stake the corners of the land that we want to acquire. Sometimes it's very difficult for people, especially if you're not familiar with looking at plans from a plan view, is to say, gosh, how does that relate to my building, my driveway, whatever? And we can actually stake it so we could go out there and look at that with them. Sometimes seeing that physical boundary, it's like, oh, okay, I can still you know, access my property just fine, or boy, this is much closer than I anticipated it. And people need that physical you know, um, uh, view, if you will, as how it's gonna affect it. So we can do that. And again, if they have either a counteroffer or things that we're not aware of that might add to um, how we're appraising that property or valuing it, then we would take that into account. So either through, you know, they might say, oh, um, what's an example? You know, if there's potentially some other element that uh, makes that property more valuable, we want to take that into consideration. Again, with that overall goal, of being fair and equitable to the property owners. So we go through that. Um, if they choose not to take that initial offer, again, they, are, they are, have the opportunity to get their own appraisal within a certain time frame. Then we continue through those negotiations through what's 
uh, the final offer where we inform the landowner that generally about two weeks, this isn't set in stone, but we do want to get this process completed by about fall of this year. So we've worked out a schedule that would allow for that. And then we, we tell them that at that point, you know, this is the final offer. This is what, based on all of our negotiations, we still feel this is fair. And then we do tell them that, you know, if we cannot reach an agreement, um, we may have to use eminent domain and that the city has that right. So explaining that process to them and then setting a deadline for when we can complete those negotiations. Um, typically, by the time we, re we reach the process where they've either denied the final offer, we do make one last attempt um, through our attorneys, through the city attorney's office and or our land negotiators to say this is our last and final offer, so our best deal that we can give you. Um, the city, we, if council has acted by that time, we will tell them that we may be using eminent domain. Um, that may be a may or a will at that time, depending on the timing. And then we can also inform uh, the owner of the potential action that they can take. And by that time, they usually have a lawyer themselves. Um, but then, you know, what our next steps are from both perspectives. All right. So I'll stop there and just ask any questions of, at this point before we get into the eminent domain process. All right, just a couple more slides here. So eminent domain is really about um, the judicial process for determining what's the value of that land that we're acquiring. So it's not about deciding whether or not we need to take it or not. That's the presumption there by the um, presiding body and it, it, um, the court is that the public entity that we've already established that, that we need the property and that we've minimized the impact to the degree possible. So they give us that um, right. Then it's really up to, it comes down to a matter of what is the value for that land. So at some point before, um, probably right before the last and final offer is made, made, we would come back to city council with very specific properties, talk about that in the study session and ask you to authorize a resolution to authorize eminent domain. So again, all that would do is that we would go to those properties and say that we would continue that process where we'd come before a hearing, before a judge, typically, if we cannot reach negotiations at that point, and a judge would decide what that true value is, that just compensation. Um, that would be at a regular um, meeting where we would pass that resolution, which would allow for public input on implementing that. And then we would, um, proceed with the city attorney to begin that eminent domain process just on those parcels where we deemed it, deemed it necessary. So what happens if it's not authorized? So council could choose not to pass that resolution. And really there's uh, three options at that point. So we could pay more, try and continue to negotiate and pay higher and higher at some point until we can get those uncooperative owners to be cooperative. Um, we could also redesign the project around that. So perhaps, you know, um, in this example, moving the bridge, moving the trail slightly one way or the other, maybe uh, going a different route through those properties. Obviously, there's some impacts there. If we were to redesign, uh, uh, that takes oftentimes more engineering work, more, and then um, environmental impacts and potentially project delays overall. And then the third option is to abandon the project. So if we felt at that time that there wasn't um, enough commitment to doing it, that we could then just forestall a part or all of the project um, and not complete it at this time. Obviously that would jeopardize our funding through Dr. Cog, but it is an option. All right, so just before I get to questions and discussion, I'll just mention um, our timeline for the project. We are completing our roughly 60 to 90% plans right now with the intent of uh, completing those towards the end of 2024 and starting that process of advertising for bids. Over the spring and summer is when we'll be doing this land acquisition process. So after tonight, 
uh, we're planning to start that process and make those initial contacts with the property owners to say, hey, we're back again after five years and we'd like to acquire some of your land. That will be that initial negotiation, or excuse me, that will be that initial um, ask to say just how much and would you consider donating it? Um, and then after that, we would move on to that very formal process that we talked about. Our overall budget um, is roughly over just over $18 million. And of that, we have $8.3 million that is identified from federal funding. So just about 45% uh, about of that is through federal funding for the overall project. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and um, okay. stand ready. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Director Andrea. Uh, Councillor Weaver. Thanks. Thanks for that presentation. Um, I feel like I, I know some of us have not been through that, but as far as the Wadsworth I, uh, project, we, we went through this quite a bit as well. Um, I was just curious, how many owners are, are you having to deal with in this project? Because I know there were just a ton with the Wadsworth thing, and I'm sort of hoping there are fewer. Quite, quite a bit fewer, Since, um, yeah. 14 total. And oh, that okay. includes RTD, and I believe we need an easement from uh, Burlington Northern as well. So those two property owners. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Additional questions? Uh, Councillor Dozman. Thank you, uh, and I appreciate just kind of the overview of that process. Um, and the, do you, do you anticipate owners, landowners being uncooperative, and that's why you felt the need to review this, or is this just so that everybody's kind of on the same page as to the process that you're going to be undertaking? I think both. Okay. So we, I think um, we did want to kind of reestablish this for all of you, especially the newer council members. But also we think that there is at least one property owner that we may need to do further, um, more intense negotiations with who may not be accepting of the project. Councillor Larson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it, it, it really does sound like you guys have done your homework on this. And, and uh, uh, no, knowing the efficiency of our staff, uh, it will move along according to the schedule. I, I certainly appreciate that. Uh, if, if you wouldn't mind, though, I'd like to, for my benefit as a, a freshman counselor, step back and um, describe some of the sort of the goal, the reason we're doing this in the first place. Because I understand the, why you'd want a bridge over uh, the, uh, tra the terminal station there. But the trail uh, goes down to the frontage road and ends there, and then there's a pedestrian crossing. Um, there are no, there's no parking lot down there. There's a bit of a, a, a on the other side of the frontage road, a bit of a, a downslope. Um, where are people expected to go? Certainly, yeah. And I think uh, maybe I could have done this a little bit uh, broader, but there is intent to develop more housing in this area, as well as potentially on the south side of the frontage road there, a future park location. So um, it's kind of a chicken and the egg. So if you build it, they will come. With our intent, hopefully, is that we will see a large draw, not only from those industrial people or the, the employees from those industrial areas where they might take the train as opposed to driving their car um, to and from work, but also uh, for that future housing, both north of the station, which is already developing, and then in the southern area as well. Okay, that, that's the piece of the jigsaw I needed. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Additional um, questions? I, I had one. Um, if I recall, there's a pretty good grade drop between the uh, south side of the tracks and the road to the bottom where the trail terminates. Mm -hmm. um, is that, do we have any issues with uh, maintaining an ADA compliant uh, path of travel? No, so um, you're correct that there is a significant grade drop. And um, it's actually, so where the red line is shown here, there's actually a very steep slope from the west to the east, but we were able to achieve about, um, I think it's 8% that you need to match to, or be less than to achieve for a trail, longitudinal grade, and we're able to match, achieve that. Okay. 
so we're not thinking we're going to launch people uh, off of the bottom of that <laughs> into the ponds or anything like that? Well, <laughs> the last thing we want to do. Yeah. It's a revenue generator. Okay, well, we, we, may, we, we have some adventurous people in our community. So <laughs> they might try it. Yeah, you never know. Okay. Uh, additional questions or discussion on this item? We've been talking. We've been talking about this one for a long time too. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, I, uh, remind me if you can, Mr. Goff. How many, we did a lot of property acquisitions for Wadsworth. We did forty or fifty. Yeah, at least in the thirty-eight, forty something. Yeah. It was a lot. Okay. Yes. And I think did we, did we uh, have, need to resort to uh, eminent domain? We had three, yeah. I think, mm -hmm. that went to had to go through that process. They never went to. I don't know if only one I think went we to trial. Went, one went to trial. One went yep. to trial. Okay. Out of that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's pretty good. And uh, is there an appeal process from the from the judge in the trial process? I'll have to check on that. I don't believe there is, but I'm not certain. district court decision, either as a result of a trial or um, a, uh, a commission, you know, the, the point three members, mm -hmm. becomes a district court order. I'm not the <clears throat> condemnation expert, Joe Rivera at our firm is, but like any other district court order, it's appealable. And I think I've seen, you know, cases by the Supreme Court and Court of Appeals, uh, but typically, you know, it's all about value. There's two, you know, there's two issues in a condemnation case. Do you have the authority to condemn? And here it's really clear because it's a public rights of way. Sometimes mm -hmm. there are other kind of weird public uses that are quasi public and, and that challenge is raised, but here there's no question. And what's the value? Okay. And so on appeal, it really would only be value. And the appellate court uh, primarily relies on a determination of fact made by the district court. You don't have fact trials in front of the appellate court. That's why the, the appeals are rare, because it would have to be some kind of procedural error at the district court level that would, that would be the basis for an appeal. Okay. So highly unlikely. All right. Thank you. And uh, Councilor Hultin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Remind me on Wadsworth, um, the eminent domain process, if I remember correctly, this was before I was seated on council, but council did not initially authorize eminent domain as part of the negotiation process. Um, and so the city had to go out and go through a lot of the iterative steps without authorization for eminent domain. Am I remembering that correctly? Correct. We had to come back um, when we knew we needed to actually take that last step of eminent domain and get approval. Um, I think staff originally asked for that blanket approval at the beginning. So, um, so that when we, just to keep things moving so that we, when we, if, if and when we needed it, we could just keep moving. But the council at that time um, asked to come back, asked us to come back um, when we got there. So, I mean, is there, I mean, in retrospect, is there any thoughts on not having that tool and how that impacted what we had to pay for properties in the negotiation? I'm not sure. It, it took longer altogether, but uh, I'm not sure that, that the, city ended up having to pay more necessarily. But I will say that for your negotiating team, having that authority at the outset is really something nice to have in your back pocket because there you are sitting in the kitchen, the living room or a conference room with the property owner. And it's really kind of initial stages, but you know, the property owner knows that you've got, you've got everything you need to carry it all the way through to the end. And that, you know, depending upon the nature of that conversation and the person and the environment in the room, that can be helpful. And looking, I mean, it's a little bit hard to tell from the aerial, but unlike Wadsworth, we're just looking at taking just portions of people's lots and not like substantially impacting their current usage. Yes, there's not um, whole, whole uh, parcels being taken. Probably the most impacted one is this triangular portion right underneath the bridge right here. I believe this is all one parcel. Okay. So this kind of um, extended portion down here is the most impacted. Okay. And the trail portion, yeah, that it's just a sloped area. It's not taking, it's not even property. Um, it's a usable property. Yeah. Okay, all right, great, thank you. Uh, Councilor Dozman. 
Thank you. So at this point in time, you're going to move forward with this process and at a later time, if needed, you'll come back to council to invoke eminent domain. Is that correct? correct. Okay. Yes. So we're most likely um, that time period will be probably July, August timeframe. So we'll have a much better idea between now and then if our negotiations are successful or not. And then when we come back to council, it would be for eminent domain on very specific parcels. Okay, and my apologies if I miss this, but after this process, when do you actually intend to break ground on the project? Yes, so our intent would be um, with the Dr. Cog funding that we have, we have to be out for advertisement for construction by October 1st of this year, which would mean that we're probably starting construction very late in 2024. Um, and then continuing all the way through 2025, so late 2025 or early 2026 to be completed. And do you anticipate working through the winter season or like taking a break and then continuing? Most likely, um, so the bridge most likely will be built off site and then brought in, so prefabbed off site. So they could get started on that over these first winter months. Um, probably some of those other items that are early procurement, um, as well as, I, probably waiting for the trail to be built until, you know, spring, summer of 2025. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Councilor Larson. Uh, just one small thing here on, uh, as you prepare and finalize the documents here, uh, make sure you've got the correct reference because I believe it's 49th Place and not 49th Avenue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Director DeAndrea, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. We're going to move now to agenda item number two. This is the discussion on the 2024 building code updates. <laughs> now, now, this is this is real stuff here. Thank you. Ready? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Please go ahead. Mr. Again, John. this is um, a very quick staff report. We just want to give you. Um, we're not looking for any direction this evening, but just wanted to give you an update on our process that we're going to move forward with very soon on updating our um, international building codes. Yes, very exciting. Um, this this will be quick, but tonight is the first step of a traditionally multi-month process. Um, some of you have this happen once or twice during your tenure because we go through this code update process usually every five to six years. Um, so tonight, two things. I wanted to give you a preview of what the process is going to look like, and I wanted to introduce you to our chief building official, um, Renee Mario. She's been here for about a year and a half, joined the Wheat Ridge team right before the cybersecurity outage, since that is our milestone moment for all of us. Um, I asked her to share a little bit of her background and then we'll run through just a couple of high notes on the code update process. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. My name is Renee Mario and I'm serving as the chief building official for the city of Wheat Ridge. Um, as Lauren said, I've been here about 18 months. Yes, I started two weeks before the data breach. <laughs> Um, I started with Charles Abbott Associates about 25 years ago as a permit technician. Um, I was horrified when I realized how long ago this has been. I then went to the County of Los Angeles for about eight years and have been back with Abbott somewhere in the 15 to 18 year range. I moved here from California about two and a half years ago. Um, I'm loving Colorado very much. And I, I wanted to say some things about my philosophy on code enforcement. I think I... I bring a unique perspective to building and safety. Um, I honestly believe that building and safety is part of a construction team. You know, we're part of their project. We're not here to, to stifle it, to make it harder. We're here to make it go forward as smoothly as possible and build safe buildings. That's our absolute ultimate goal. Um, the adopted codes is the authority for technical building. However, sometimes it requires the city to look at intent versus letter of the code. Building codes, by their very nature, are reactive instead of proactive. They're written every three years. Uh, you can imagine the technology advancements in construction projects and techniques. So codes don't get updated until after these products have been vetted, used, proven. So that puts the city in kind of an interesting perspective because some builder may come and say, hey, I want to use this innovative product. How do we do that? 
So then it's my job to evaluate and make sure that it's meeting the intent of the code and that it's safe. And then once we decide that, then we can, we can approve it. So I really do feel like we're part of the project team. And I hope that the constituents of the city feel that. I, I think we've had some good breakthroughs. We worked with the local works and the makerspace, getting them in. Um, I think, you know, we, we've been successful in the time I've been here, I hope. And please, if you ever have a question, comment, or whatever, ask. I'm happy to explain to the best of my ability what the intent of the code was or why we are asking for certain things in the project. Thank you. Yeah, Renee is definitely a solution-oriented code expert, which has been fun to collaborate on. Um, so we're currently enforcing the 2018 international codes. We go every other cycle, so we're looking for a green light from you to move forward um, with the process of adopting the 2024 codes. Um, in Colorado, every jurisdiction adopts them uh, individually. Sometimes a state does it for you. That means every jurisdiction is kind of on their own code. Each does their own local amendment. It allows for some lively conversation around sort of what topics in Wheat Ridge need either more relief or more restriction, um, depending on the topic. The 24 codes were just released in December, so we're still digesting those. Um, we included an attachment that gives you a little bit of a flavor of what kind of topics come up when a code gets updated. Um, as Renee said, the International Code Council really prioritizes health and safety. Um, so you'll see they're sometimes trying to correct like a code writing issue or an actual safety issue. Um, acknowledging new building materials you might have seen in there. It acknowledges shipping materials or shipping containers as a building material. Um, Acknowledges new trends. The uh, escape room was in there. You have to have rules about egress, egress from an escape room. Um, and then just some sort of basic uh, new technologies like uh, motion activated lights, um, other smaller things. And then ultimately, as Renee said, the goal of the code is to provide flexibility to both designers and contractors. Um, so we are hoping for the green light to start this process because it does take some, some time and engagement of other groups as well. We'll be back to you this summer to get into the weeds and some of those specific provisions. Um, we'll engage our building code advisory board. They often get um, sidelined through most of the year when there's not an issue, but they're, they're very, very much engaged in this code update process. They bring an expertise and a perspective um, that supplements some of the other stakeholders, our fire districts. They have strong opinions on what we should be amending or not in the fire code. Um, we usually end up reaching out to certain stakeholders, contractors, or developers, depending on um, the local amendments that we want to talk about. So again, tonight, really just um, seeking your simple direction on um, press, pass and go, um, and we'll be back to you in a couple of months to get into the details. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Questions from Council? Uh, Councilor Hultine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, maybe I'm just a shade off of uh, Council Member Weaver's excitement, but uh, it dawns on me this is my third update I think I've paid attention to in the city. I've had several reminders tonight how long I've been paying attention in the city because it's my second Parks and Rec master plan. <laughs> um, uh, one one request for consideration, uh, you have a list of stakeholdering and um, I would love for you to consider sustainable Wheat Ridge in that a lot of code amendments are really uh, in line with what we're trying to accomplish through our sustainability efforts. And we just today, the mayor and I met with the contractor who's working on our sustainability plan update and a lot of the, the goals and ambitions that really are targeting greenhouse gas emissions come through our building standards as well as electrification of our transportation system. So um, it would be great to involve them as well in that development of what we're looking at and what we'd consider for amendments. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, one of the other plans we are doing in this year's Choose Your Adventure in Wheat Ridge is the Sustainable Action Plan, and Renee is part of the internal staff team supporting that effort too, so we can make sure we're in lockstep. Their completion date will likely align with our code adoption timeline, so hopefully they complement each other. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Councilor Dozman. Thank you. So uh, with the 2024 uh, updates just being released, how likely is state legislation or other factors um, you know, potentially going to change that? That's a great question. There are a couple bills at the legislature that we're tracking that are kind of one-offs, uh, like regional local amendments, I would say. They're not, um, they're 
they probably could have come up in any year, not specifically in response to the 2024 I codes. Um, so we will continue to keep tracking um, what's happening at the state level. The bigger issue that's in Colorado at the state level is the um, energy codes, and those will align. The 2024 energy codes align pretty well with what the Department of Energy is requiring. Anything else you're thinking on that topic? Yeah. The um, yes. I my today. I'm feeling less worked up about state legislation today than last Monday. Um, and my current approach is just to sort of wait and see and fold into our process, whatever wherever the state lands. Yeah. So, what is the benefit of up, up, updating to the 2024 as opposed to the 2021? Oh, that's a good question. Um, one thing we didn't speak to in this memo is insurance rates, and homeowners' insurance rates actually do correlate to the building code adoption, um, building code version that your city has adopted. So if your city's building codes are too old, um, it could eventually impact your community's insurance rates. It's more complicated. We can get into the suites at some point if there's more questions, but um, it will do, it will be a benefit of us to go to the 24s. Half, half of our peer committees will be doing the same. Any other questions? Councilor Weaver. Uh, actually, I don't have a question. I just wanted to welcome Renee. And I have just heard very positive things from neighbors who are doing building and just how great your folks are. Um, so thank you for that. And I, I just think it's we're getting really good feedback out in the field of how this those processes have been improving. So now I'm able to put a face on that process. So thank you. And, and welcome <laughs> after 18 months. Um, and with that, can I ask for consensus on this? I don't think I've ever asked for a consensus before. Are there any more comments you know, or questions? I, if you want to, if you want to get consensus, they're going to come to this. They're going to come back with this to us anyway. But if you want to ask, for but then don't you need? Okay, I'm asking for consensus. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, to give them the green light. Well, then, do we have consensus to green light this program? All right, looks like we do. Thank you very much. The first for everything, right? Excellent. Okay. Well, you know, that, uh, that gets through our, our business items here. We'll uh, now go to staff reports. I'm sure we can wrap this up in an hour. That's it. So. Yep, that's all we got tonight. Okay, and any, uh, any elected officials feel like they need to do, do some more speaking? Oh, Councilor I Rosen. just wanted to say happy Easter <laughs> and have fun this okay. weekend. very good. I'll... Uh, I'll echo that and say thank you all for sticking around for this meeting. We will stand adjourned and see everybody back here next week.